Hi. As I mentioned at the beginning of lecture 35A, here for the last three lectures, 35, 36, 37, I'm going to be splitting them into three parts. This is lecture 35C. In lecture 34B, there was no part C, we talked about Fourier polynomials and hinted at Fourier series and partial differential equations. In 35C, we're going to talk about a particular partial differential equation called the heat equation and ask what it means to be a solution. We'll look at some graphs, and we'll, we will hint at the relevance of Fourier polynomials and Fourier series. In lecture 36C, we will then combine PDEs and Fourier series. Okay, so that's what you have to look forward to. We're real, going real basics here. here. Um, Fourier series, partial differential equations are all very, or can be very advanced topics. We want to just understand the basics. Okay? We've seen the Fourier polynomials and Fourier series are an application of linear algebra, in particular inner product spaces, though I'm not going to talk about inner product spaces in this lecture. Here's a famous PD, partial differential equation, the heat equation. In the early 1800s, Joseph Fourier, I don't know how to say Joseph in French, Joseph, sorry if my French is terrible, I'm sorry, Fourier was trying to mathematically model heat conduction. His mathematical method used partial differential equations, PDEs, as opposed to ordinary differential equations, ODEs. Ordinary differential equations involve ordinary derivatives. Partial differential equations involve partial derivatives. The functions we want to find are functions of more than one variable. His consideration led to cons the construction of what we now call Fourier series to try to solve these PDEs. In the simplest case, we can consider heat diffusion along, say, a finite length thin rod, okay, some linear medium, so to speak. Can you make such a thin rod that's truly one-dimensional? Not really, but it's an idealization. We could also consider the case where the rod is so long that we might as well take it to be infinite. It's kind of like modeling almost discontinuous functions with truly discontinuous functions, like I mentioned in lecture 35b about Laplace transforms on the unit step function. It might be simpler to model the rod as an infinite thing if it's just really long. It might be simpler. Let x be the position of a point. Would that point be an atom? Yeah. I'm not going to get into that. It's an idealized point along the rod. Say for a between or for x between a and b, a is the x coordinate of the left endpoint of the rod. That's a, and b is the x coordinate of the right endpoint of the rod. And let t be time, say, for all t greater than or equal to zero. And of course, if you're thinking about this kind of thing in real life, you need to think about units of temperature, for example, um, which is what we're going to model here. Units for x could be meters, could be centimeters. Units for t, probably one second. Yes, take u of t comma x to be the temperature of the rod at time t in position x. It could be degrees Fahrenheit. It could be degrees Celsius. It could be Kelvin. If we allow it to be degrees Fahrenheit or Celsius, it could be negative sometimes. And so, I mean, the scale does need to be considered in real life. So it's a temperature at a specific point at a specific time. It can vary as t varies and x varies. It's a function of more than one variable. We want to solve a differential equation. We want its derivatives to exist. We want it to be smooth. Smooth is sort of a non-precise term that basically means nice and differentiable with continuous derivatives of whatever order you need, first derivatives or second or third. Yeah, it doesn't have continuous derivatives, maybe even of all orders. Infinitely differentiable with continuous derivatives. The answer to this question can depend on the setup of the model. There are actually some models where we will assume as t increases from 0, we go from basically, you might say, a discontinuous function, like a step function or something, to something that, isn't, that is continuous. So it, it depends. The function utx is typically assumed to satisfy a particular PDE called the heat equation on some open domain in the tx plane. tx plane. x is between a and b. T is greater than or equal to zero, 
Actually, it's more typically thought of as an XT plane with X horizontal and T vertical. The domain might be something like this infinite strip that goes up forever and ever in the T direction. It's not an open domain here. It's really closed. I'm including the boundary. Along the boundary, that's kind of where the lack of differentiability could occur. On the interior, in the open part that does not include the boundary, then you would want things to be nice and smooth. I said open domain. Uh, well, OK, yeah. The open domain that where it satisfies the PDE is the interior of this. does not include the boundary. Along the boundary, it's going to be defined along the boundary, but along the boundary, it's got to satisfy boundary conditions. It takes this form. And k is positive here. It's supposed to be a positive k. I was a little confused in the last lecture for b. The partial derivative of u with respect to t, this curvy d means partial derivative. It's, it's not a big deal to change the letter. I mean, we could have kept the same letter d for a derivative even with partial der derivatives. It just kind of alerts you to the fact that, hey, u depends on more than one variable. It's first order partial with respect to t equals some constant k times the second order partial of u with respect to the x variable. t is time, x is position. So you can think of time as going by. Here, this is a rate of change of the temperature over time. And this is related to the concavity of the initial distribution of heat or temperature, you might say. Alternative notation involves subscripts for the partial derivatives. Why do we do this? Because it's quicker to write. We can also subtract k, u, x, x from both sides to write it like this, with the 0 on the right side. As such an equation with the 0 on the right-hand side, we would call it homogeneous. We're also going to see it's a linear differential equation, a linear partial differential equation. This left-hand side we will see here in this lecture that it essentially defines a linear operator on function spaces. We're not going to specify what the function spaces are. You can try making it forced by putting some function of t over here. This has analogs with ordinary differential equations. It would be a forced heat equation. Mathematically, we seek solutions of this PDE, functions of two variables, which upon substitution make the left-hand side equal right-hand side, just like with ODEs. Hmm, can we think of any solutions? Simplest solutions I can think of are linear functions of x. U, and we often abuse notation. We might write u equals u of x, uh, tx. We usually put the t first. U of tx. But it only depends on x, no t's. For any constant c and d, that'll work. Because it'll make the left and right hand sides both 0 for all t and x. This will work over the entire xt plane. This derivative, since there's no t's, will be 0 for all t and x. This derivative, since it's a second derivative of a linear function in x, will also be 0 no matter what t and x are. That's certainly solutions. What would they represent as far as heat changing over time? It seems like this is constant in time. That kind of thing would only work if the boundary of your thin rod was kept at a constant temperature somehow. That's the only way this kind of thing would work as a physical model. Physically, we want to find a particular, maybe unique solution that matches the initial data at t equals 0, what the initial temperature distribution as a function of x when t is 0, and the boundary conditions at x equals a and x equals b, which when t is 0, you can think of those as points, but when t is allowed to be greater than or equal to 0, then those boundaries become these entire vertical lines here. There are lots and lots of solutions. There's infinitely many, but the unique solutions depend on these initial data and the boundary conditions. You, by the way, the t equals 0 initial data can also be thought of as a boundary condition because it's a condition along that boundary. Sometimes you think of the boundary as the boundary of the, this domain. Sometimes you think of it as the boundary of the interval from A to B. It's a little bit of a vague term that way. Technically speaking, we should derive why this PE might be a good model, but we don't have the time. Okay? 
if you want to be a, a good engineer, a good physicist, there are derivations that you should look up and think about. They're not real easy, but you can do it. They're, they're doable to understand. So I would highly encourage you, but we don't have the time. We want to just understand the basics. How about some non-trivial solutions? I'm going to consider two classes of solutions that are non-trivial. We will check them in Mathematica that they work. And these are two important classes. By non-trivial, I don't mean non, just non-zero. I mean non-trivial, like non-linear, and having t's in them as well, like this function. U is u of tx. Abusing notation here, u representing both a dependent variable and a function name, is e to the negative k omega squared times t times cosine omega x. That function, as a function of two variables, t and x, solve the heat equation. k must match the k in the heat equation, sometimes called the diffusivity constant, related to how fast the heat flows, related to the material used for the rod. What's omega? Well, omega is an arbitrary positive number related to the um, whatever this frequency would be of this cosine. And that's got to be related to the initial data and the boundary data. Could depend on how maybe your initial temperature distribution it itself is a sinusoidal wave with a certain frequency. This would depend on that. So how do you check it? Check the left-hand side equals right-hand side. Here's the derivative with, with respect to t. Take the time to think about this in your mind. This factor doesn't depend on t. It's a constant with respect to t, so it just gets carried along. This one does depend on t. Factor of negative k omega squared, which by the way, because of the neg negative sign, is a negative coefficient of t. This is like an an exponentially decaying amplitude of a cosine function, in a sense. The amplitude decays over time. Because of the chain rule, I get an extra factor of negative k omega squared. We also need to find the first derivative with respect to x. Now treat t as constant. Derivative of cosine omega x is negative sine omega x times omega. By the chain rule, I get a negative sine and also an omega in there and the e to the negative k omega squared t gets carried along. Then take another derivative, you're going to get to a negative cosine. And also multiply by k, and they match. That matches this. It's a solution for all t and x, even negative t's, and x is not between a and b. It is a solution. <clears throat> Here are some graphs of u versus x for various times t, taking k to be 1 and omega to be 1. You get a picture that's like this, and I graphed it between negative pi and pi, suggestively relating it to lecture 34b, where we were talking about inner product spaces, continuous functions on the interval from negative pi to pi. I could have picked a different interval, but that's what I picked. Red is the initial temperature distribution at t equals 0 has positive and negative values, so maybe this is in Celsius or something. Pink, magenta is the temperature distribution at 0.5, time 0.5. Orange at time 1, blue at time 2. You can see the temperature evening out over time. Heat is flowing from hot areas toward cold areas in both directions. That's some intuition why this might work. And then there are other formulas you could come up with that technically would have graphs that look like this. But, you know, like if you made an, I don't know, an omega to the fourth power instead of an omega squared, but technically they would not model heat flow as well, because technically they wouldn't solve the heat equation, even though the graphs would be somewhat similar. What initial conditions and boundary conditions does this satisfy over the interval shown? from negative pi to pi. The red graph is the initial data, so to speak. That's the initial temperature distribution. What about boundary conditions at negative pi and pi? Well, they do change over time. They're not constant. They do equal some value for the red graph at t equals negative pi and pi. More importantly, if we had to try to derive this solution, 
What's key here is that the slopes of these graphs at negative pi and pi are all zero. That would be the more important thing to know ahead of time if you were trying to solve the differential equation based on this initial data and maybe just the assumption that might seem reasonable in a certain situation that the rate of change of the temperature distribution at the endpoints would be zero. Not constant temperature, but constant rate of change with respect to x is what I'm talking about, with respect to the location. Next example is this one. 1 over square root of 4 pi kt, there's a t there, e to the negative x squared over 4 kt, another t there and an x there. Square root of 4 is 2, I could write it this way. I could bring the square root of t in the denominator up in, in, to, uh, as a t to the negative 1 half of the numerator. That would be easier for checking. I am going to show you the check on Mathematica, but just trust me, this solves the heat equation. These are the results of the calculations. I actually did not take the time to completely do these on my own. I did use Mathematica. I did check some things. And the key thing at the end here is that this equals this, and this equals this, and these two things here and here match. For all x, and for all t that is strictly positive, t can't equal zero here. So what does that mean about the initial condition when t equals zero? Hmm, we'll have to think about that maybe with Mathematica. Graphs of u versus x for various t's when k is 1 look like this. So the red graph is not initial data at t equals 0, but it is almost initial data at t equals 0.1. Maybe we'd have to think about it the initial time being 0.1 or something, but uh, hmm. pink is t is 0.5, orange is t is 1, blue is t is 2. The, once again, the temperature profile, the distribution is evening out leveling, so to speak, leveling out. You might wonder, is the area under all these graphs equal to the same thing? You might wonder that and see if you can figure it out. Uh, I guess we're all doing integrals, which maybe wouldn't be so easy. Integrals with respect to x. Hmm. Yeah, man, probably not so easy or maybe it's even impossible. But it's something you, you can numerically approximate it to. Linear combinations of solutions are solutions. That's because this expression can be thought of as a linear operator. It's, tra it's a transformation from one function space to another. What does that mean? It means take an arbitrary function of two variables, t and x, that's twice continuously differentiable, say. Find its derivative with respect to t, subtract k times its second derivative with respect to x. Form that combination. That process gives you a new function. That process of taking the original function and giving a new function is a transformation between function spaces, and it is a linear transformation, a linear operator. Why? Here's a verification of it. Take an arbitrary linear combination. Alpha and beta are numbers. U and V are functions of T and X. Differentiate that with respect to T. Subtract K times its second derivative with respect to X. Use the linearity of ordinary differentiation. When you differentiate this, you get this. When you differentiate this part twice and also distribute the k through the parentheses, you get that, minus k through. And then you can rearrange, you can group these two terms together and use group these two terms together. That's a commutative property of real number addition. Uh, factor out an alpha of the first one and a beta out of the second two, these two, and get alpha times the linear operator applied to u plus beta times the linear operator applied to v equals the linear operator applied to alpha u plus beta v, v a linear combination. Alpha and beta are real numbers, u and v are functions of t and x. Therefore, because it's a linear operator, linear combinations of solutions are solutions. The operation preserving property would guarantee that. Right hand side zero. In fact, solutions are in the are the kernel of the linear operator. We can talk about kernels still. 
I'm not saying what the function spaces are, because that's a bit too technical for us. For example, the following expression, which becomes a Fourier polynomial when t is 0, solves the heat equation. What I did here was I took the, um, the first example with the cosines. I plugged in uh, omega equals different things for each term. Omega is 1 there, omega is 2 there, omega is 3 there, omega is 4 there. The k I left arbitrary. There's an omega squared, 1 squared there is 1. 2 squared is 4, 3 squared is 9, 4 squared is 16. Where do the 1, negative 1 half, 1 third, and negative 1 fourth come from? I just made them up. Those are arbitrary coefficients. I just made them up. I just felt like doing that. Note that when you plug in t equals 0, it becomes a Fourier polynomial like we talked about in lecture 3, 4b, as a function of x. Combination of cosines, in this case, of different frequencies with the coefficients of x being 1, 2, 3, then 4. Making this whole thing be periodic with period 2 pi. Now, you might wonder, what about other periods besides 2 pi? There are ways to adjust it. I'm not going to talk about them in this lecture. Okay, so we'll end here now looking at the Mathematica. Here I can plug the function in and check it's a solution. I have Mathematica calculate the derivatives for me. The key thing is that this derivative with respect to t is equal to the k times the second derivative with respect to x. Those two things are equal. Here's a static plot that um, is actually a three-dimensional plot of u of xt, or tx. Time going to the right, x going into the screen, positive x over here, negative x in front of the screen, so to speak. Which means actually if you turn it this way, it's misleading because x positive goes to the left there. You have to reflect it. If you look at it this way and focus on the, the back of it, then it's right, though it's symmetric anyway. Here's the graph that I showed you in the PowerPoint. And here's a manipulate that shows you the heat, the temperature distribution changing over time. Heat is flowing from hotter regions to colder regions in a very precise way that has to satisfy the heat equation. Here's the other example with more complicated derivatives. There's the derivative with respect to t. Here's the first derivative with respect to x. And then the second derivative with respect to x also times k. And this matches this here. Uh, here are the graphs that I showed you before. And then we can look at a um, manipulate as well. see again the temperature distribution and evening, evening out. Makes good intuitive sense. Here I did allow t to get really close to zero by going all the way to the left here. And that's showing you the temperature distribution going way up as t approaches zero. What is that representing? I call it a, a point mass solution. In a sense, it's like infinity when t is zero at position x equals zero and zero elsewhere. You got a point mass of temperature. What happens to that? as time goes by. That's sort of an idealized way to think about this as t goes to zero. And the linear combination uh, turns out to look like this when t is zero. <coughs> this is the linear combination example. And now I let time go by. And you see still, even though it had a lot of wobbles to begin with, it's a sum of cosines of different frequencies. As t increases, those wobbles even out. And it may be that the long-term temperature at any location is zero here. And yeah, I think that might be the case. Okay. The exponential decay term in the formula in front, yes, that would guarantee it. For any x, this is eventually going to go to zero as t continues to increase. Okay. So again, next time in lecture 36c, we'll try to combine 
partial differential equations and Fourier polynomials in series more seriously. I didn't mean to make a pun, but hey, I'm glad I made a pun. Thanks for watching.